This is the Proton Guru video practice for topic 1.16. These problems will give you practice on conformational analysis of cycloalkanes and specifically a great deal of practice on the chair conformation of cyclohexane. Some brief and straightforward reading to get you ready for these kinds of problems can be found in the Organic Chemistry 1 Primer 2018. And you can find additional chemistry videos and information on how to match those videos up with different chapters and different textbooks um, to help you in your course at ProtonGuru.com. We'll spend our first part of this video learning about drawing cyclohexane in the chair conformation and by showing all the hydrogen atoms and indicating whether they are axial or equatorial, we will gain a great deal of knowledge on the shape of the cyclohexane ring. This will really help us do all the other types of problems much, much more easily. So this is how you initially learn to draw cyclohexane, probably just as a hexagon. You can easily turn that normal looking hexagon into a chair conformation. First we kind of tip it, so I'm imagining tipping that hexane towards the side, looking at it from the side so that this is the side of the cyclohexane ring that's tilted towards us. And if we think then about tipping one of these sides up and tipping one of these sides down, these pointed parts, we'll get something that looks like this. And this looks a lot like what the chair conformation of cyclohexane usually does when people draw it out in textbooks and for exams and things. So if we have this structure, we've taken a hexagon, tilted it over, and then tipped the point up and the point down, we still have to figure out how these different carbons look. Well, every carbon, of course, has two hydrogens, and it's important to know which way they point. Do they point like this, or do they point out like this? That's going to be what people are testing you on with a lot of different types of cyclohexane-involving questions. But knowing that each of these carbons in the structure is sp3 hybridized with four bonds, it should be a tetrahedral shape. And we usually would draw the tetrahedron like this. And if we think about that as being a right side up tetrahedron in the sense that this H is pointed straight up. And then of course, this is the bond that points towards us because we tilted our cyclohexane so that this would be the front of the hexagon. And if we go over to this other side, if we have two bonds going one away from us and one towards us, well, the other two bonds have to go here to make up the other parts of the tetrahedron. So that's what we have here. So when people draw out the chair conformation, they're assuming that you know that the carbons are tetrahedral and that this is the part of the ring that's pointing out towards you. Once you know that, you know that those lines actually are wedges. That has to be a hash line. And then you can tell how the hydrogens have to point one up and one down or one straight down, one angled up, to make the usual tetrahedral shapes we're used to seeing that I've highlighted in blue here. Well, what about all the other hydrogens on the other sites? Well, those sites are also tetrahedral carbon atoms, so we can envision more sites. We could draw a tetrahedron in the front. It looks a little bit messier than when I drew them on the corners, or on this back side here. As long as you understand that these bonds have to come forward because that's the part of the ring that you've tipped towards you, and then this goes back to the back part of the ring, and this goes back towards the back part of the ring, you kind of know to make the carbons tetrahedral where the hydrogens have to be. And at that point, we can really draw the chair cyclohexane with all of its hydrogens in. It's really an alternating set of right side up tetrahedra, upside down tetrahedron, right side up tetrahedron, upside down tetrahedron, right side up, and upside down. If you look at any one of these individual carbons, you can see it has the usual tetrahedral shape. So understanding that it's really just alternating right side up and upside down, quote unquote, tetrahedra, makes it easy for us to answer the question about which are axial and equatorial if we know the definitions. The axial hydrogens are the ones that point straight up or straight down. We've kind of been circling those already, so just highlighting those in blue makes those easy to see. All the rest that I've left in black, they're not straight up and down. They're kind of angled up, angled down around the ring like these. Well, those are all the equatorial hydrogens. The question also asks us which part of the ring is closest to the viewer, and that's this lower part of the horizontal side of the ring. We need to know that to understand fully the shape of the cyclohexane chair conformation. And having this understanding of the shape, we can now do a bunch of different types of problems involving our knowledge of the chair conformation. So here we're asked simply to draw all the configurational isomers of 1,3-dimethyl cyclohexane. Well, all these problems are going to require us to be able to set up the scaffold and know what units have equatorial and axial positions available. 
And in this problem, we're only asked to put substituents on positions 1 and 3. So just to simplify the drawing, I've omitted then all the other positions I drew in on the previous scaffold, and I number this 1, 2, 3. And the problem asks us to put a methyl group on position 1 and a methyl group on position 3. Now for each of those, there are two choices. Our methyl group could go equatorial, or it could go axial down here. So we have two choices for each one. And if we do all four permutations, we could have, all right, I'm going to put it equatorial on this one, equatorial on this one. Leave this one equatorial, but then switch this one to axial. Or I can switch the one on this position to be axial, the other one's equatorial. Or they could both be axial. And that's the answer to the question that was asked. And now we have a follow-up question. Now that we have all those possible configurational isomers, we should indicate which methyl groups are axial and which are equatorial in each structure. Label each as cis or trans. Identify any gauche or 1, 3 diaxial repulsions in each structure. Which is the most stable cis isomer? Which is the most stable trans isomer? This is really a laundry list of all the different types of questions you might be asked for analyzing structures of chair cyclohexanes with substituents. So let's take a look at these one question at a time. First, it asks us which methyl groups are axial and which are equatorial. Well, here I've just highlighted all the axial positions as blue, like I did in our drawing of cyclohexane. The methyl groups that are axial are those that I've circled, and we put a square around the methyl groups that are equatorial. The next part of the question asks us to label each of these as being either cis or trans. Well, cis means that both of the substituents are pointed in the same direction. So if I have two that are up, like here, or two that are down, like here, those are examples of cis. It has absolutely nothing to do with whether they're equatorial or axial. They could both be equatorial, they could both be axial, or you could have one of each, as long as they're pointed the same direction. So this is a cis isomer, and this is also a cis isomer. If you have one down and one up, that's by definition a trans isomer. One down, one up, this one would be trans as well. So now we've identified the cis and trans isomer. The next part of the problem is a little more difficult. It asks us to identify any gauche or 1,3-diaxial repulsive interactions. Well, the gauche interactions we learned about and identified using Newman instructions in our video for lesson 1.15, if you want to review that. So maybe we should look at the Newman projections for these sites that have methyl groups that might have gauche interactions. So I've highlighted this part of this ring in blue, and I'm going to draw just that part of the ring over here. And if I draw just that part of the ring, and I use R to represent the rest of the ring that is still shown in black here, just use R for that, you can see that I can draw a Newman projection of this where this is down, so put that here, this H is up, and this R is up, H and R. So that's the front of my Newman projection. The back part of my Newman projection will be this unit, where I have an H straight up, this R group tilted down to the left, that's right there, and then this H is right here. In the Newman projection, then, it's pretty easy to see the Gauss interaction. The Gauss, remember, is when you have a methyl or some group that's not hydrogen bumping into another group that's not hydrogen. They're not eclipsing yet, but they're right beside each other in a staggered conformation. That's the definition of a Gauss interaction. Now, if I had my methyl group here, which would be an equatorial position, if my methyl group was here, it would be beside two hydrogens. So only when I have axial methyl groups do I have Gauss interactions. So I'd have a Gauss interaction in this structure, this structure, and this structure. No Gauss interactions here because both of these methyl groups are equatorial. The question also asks specifically about 1,3-diaxial repulsions, and the name suggests that this occurs when you have 1, 2, 3 at positions 1 and 3. You have axial substituents that are not hydrogens. And they're getting close enough, especially easy to see if you were to draw out the hydrogens. If it's equatorial, any branches you have, even if it's pretty big branches, are going to point away from the ring more. So now we've identified all the compounds that have Gauss interactions and 1,3-diaxial repulsion. The next part of the question is, now that you know what the repulsions are that might destabilize molecules, which is the most stable cis isomer and which is the most stable trans isomer? Well, for cis, we have this one versus this one. This cis molecule has a diaxial repulsion, and each of these axial methyls also has a Gauss interaction. That's pretty destabilizing, especially since this one has two equatorial methyl groups. So this is the more stable of the two cis isomers. How about these trans isomers? 
Well, I have one gauche interaction here and one gauche interaction with this methyl group between this methyl group and the ring here. So they're both the same. So either one of these would be an example of the most stable trans ice. And you're not always asked to draw all the possible conformations. Sometimes they just say, well, what's the lowest energy conformation? And they'll give you one particular structure to solve for. And you'll start this out kind of the same way. You want to start off with a scaffold showing the axial and equatorial sites that are on the one and two positions. Now, it doesn't matter what you number position one. You could have studied one and two there. But for me, it's pretty easy to see where the substituents should be on positions one and two. So I usually use those. Next, no matter what else happens, we want to minimize the repulsion as much as possible if we're looking for the lowest energy, which means the most stable conformation. So we have two substituents we have to place, isopropyl and methyl. The isopropyl group, if you don't remember, looks like that. And the methyl group, of course, is just a CH3. So isopropyl is much bigger. Repulsion between the isopropyl group and something else would be much more significant than between a methyl group and something else. So because the equatorial site does not have gauche interactions, but the axial does, we want to put the big group there so it won't have any gauche interactions with the rest of the ring, for example. So in position one, we should have the isopropyl group in the equatorial position and the methyl group will have to go somewhere else. Well, once we've placed our larger substituent equatorial to minimize the strain, we don't really have a choice of where to put the methyl group because the methyl group has to go cis to wherever we've just put this isopropyl group. Well, the isopropyl group is up and this hydrogen is down. Cis tells you that both groups have to go the same direction. So on position two, the methyl group also has to go up. So our final structure would have the methyl group up and the isopropyl group up. And usually, people will draw out the structure without the hydrogens drawn. It's a little harder to see where everything is, so you can always fill in those hydrogens for your own visual reference to recognize the tetrahedral shapes. But this is usually what it would look like if you had a multiple choice test and you were trying to pick which was the most stable from a series of choices. And here's a good way to draw it out. Another type of question that you'll see a lot on organic chemistry tests is something like this, where you're shown a simple structure and asked what is the IUPAC name for these molecule. And it starts off being pretty straightforward. You just have to figure out what the parent chain is, which is the cyclohexyl unit. And then you have to list the substituents alphabetically. We have an ethyl and a methyl substituent. So this is some type of ethyl methyl cyclohexane. We have to add numbers to show where these substituents add. You always give the lowest number to the alphabetically first site where you have a choice. One, two, three, four. So ethyl will be at position one. So it's one ethyl four methyl cyclohexane. The place where a lot of people forget to put the rest of the name in is right here. So without the cis that you've got to find out from up, up, cis, you would not have the correct name yet. 